Hello dear students, uh, I am Dr. Nazif Mahabu. I am working as a lecturer in the Department of Anatomy at Dr. Siaju Islam Medical College. Today we are going to study on the topic of stomach. This is entitled as item number 3 in the abdomen card. And um, the abdomen card is the card where we study the most of the viscera that lies in our abdomen. So, um, without further ado, let's start. So, to understand stomach, we need to um, learn some basics of the abdomen and that is uh, quadrant of the abdomen. Okay, because when you're going to learn about the viscera, so you need to know properly the positions in which the viscera lie in within the abdomen. So, let's begin. Quadrants of the abdominal cavity. So the abdominal cavity is divided into several quadrants. Okay, so they are divided by two lines. They are the two horizontal line and two vertical line. The horizontal line can be named as transpyloric plane and also transtubercular plane. And the vertical lines are called the right midclavicular line and the left midclavicular line. So let's know something about the transpyloric plane. The transpyloric plane, this is the transpyloric plane. It passes over the pylorus of the stomach, midline of the joining line of the GFAT process and umbilicus. So what are the structures that lie at the level of the transpyloric plane. So you can see if this is a transpyloric plane then these are the structures which lie. So we can say that the pylorus of the stomach, the fundus of the gallbladder, the hilum of the kidney, the lumbar one vertebra uh, to be specific the lower part of the lumbar one vertebra and so on. Then the transtubercular plane. This is the transtubercular plane. It passes over the tubercle of the iliac crest of the hip bone. So the line that passes over the tubercle of the iliac crest of the hip bone is called the transtubercular plane. Then there are two vertical lines. You see these two vertical lines. So one is the right vertical line, another is the left vertical line. Okay, so the right vertical line and the left vertical line, they are called the right midclavicular line and the left midclavicular line. So why are they called midclavicular line? Because they are drawn from the level of the midpoint of the clavicle. If this is a clavicle and if this is a clavicle, then it is in the midpoint of the two clavicles. So from the midpoint of the right clavicle, it's right midclavicular line. Similarly, from the midpoint of the left clavicle is the left midclavicular line. So these two lines, actually the transpyloric plane, the transtubercular plane, the right midclavicular line and the left midclavicular line, it divides the regions of the abdomen into nine quadrants. Into nine quadrants. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All of these quadrants have their individual name. You see, in the middle, it is called the umbilical region. In the middle is called the umbilical region. In the left of the umbilical region is called left lumbar region. In the right um, umbilical region, in the um, uh, right side, it is called right lumbar region. Now, above the umbilical region is the epigastric region. Similarly, in the left side of the epigastric region is left hypochondriac region. And on the right side is right hypochondriac region. Below the umbilical region, it is called hypogastric region. On the left side, it is called left iliac region. On the right side, it is called right iliac region. So the right hypochondric region, epigastric region, left hypochondric region, right lumbar region, umbilical region and left lumbar region, right iliac region, 
hypogastric region and left iliac region. <clears throat> so these are the nine quadrants of the abdominal cavity. So what are the importance of knowing these quadrants? It is if we know the exact location of the quadrants then we can know the exact location of the different viscera that lie within these quadrants. You know sometimes a written question appears in the examination draw and level of the abdominal quadrants with its clinical importance. So if that question comes then you have to draw it like this and write the clinical importance. Okay, so now let's enter into the stomach, our main topic for today, item number three. Okay, so first of all, where does stomach lie? You know, in the abdominal quadrant. If we go back again, you can see that stomach lies mainly in the epigastric region, in the left hypochondric region, and a little bit on the umbilical region. So these three region actually consist stomach. Okay, now what is stomach? Stomach is actually a muscular organ. So why do we call it a muscular organ? Because the muscle of the stomach is smooth muscle. You already know that muscles are of different type like voluntary skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, cardiac muscles. Okay, now, so stomach is a muscular organ which contains smooth muscle. Now, the extension of the stomach is between esophagus above and duodenum below. Okay, above lies esophagus and lower in the below lies duodenum. So, in between there is the stomach. So, the length of the stomach is 25 centimeter and it is placed obliquely. You know the shape of the stomach is actually J-shaped when empty and it um, appears a pyriform shape when it's full. So if we <clears throat> try to know the capacity of the stomach, that is at birth, the capacity of the stomach is 30 ml per cubic millimeter. At the puberty, it, it is 1000 ml and at adult stage it is 1500 ml. So what is actually the function of the stomach? The function of the stomach we can say that it acts as a reservoir of the food. Also it mines the food particle with digestive juice. Right? Do you know what mines mean? It means mixes. That means the stomach mixes the food particles with the digestive juices and also it helps in digestion. Now let's um, dig into some other general features of the stomach. <coughs> Sorry. So the stomach has two orifices, right? It has two orifices. Do you know what does orifice mean? You see, these are the orifice. These are the orifice. Okay. So these two orifices are known. One as the cardiac orifice. Another is the pyloric orifice. The orifice is also known as end. So we can tell it the cardiac end or cardiac orifice. And this is the pyloric end or pyloric orifice. So the cardiac orifice here, it lies 2.5 centimeter left to the median plane. Suppose if this is a median plane, then the cardiac orifice lies 2.5 centimeter medially. It is situated at the level of thoracic 11 vertebra in the behind and on the left it is in the position of the 7th costal cartilage. So suppose if we are seeing the stomach from the behind, so behind will be the 11 thoracic vertebra and on the left side, here, on the left side, if there is ribs over here, then that will be the seventh, left seventh costal cartilage. 
Now, the pyloric orifice. The pyloric orifice is situated about 2.5 cm right to the median plane. Now, the pyloric orifice also lies at the level of the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra. Okay, it lies at the lower lumbar of the first, it lies at the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra. The pyloric end is thick and nodular. You have to remember that, that the pyloric end is very thick and nodular. Do you know why this part is thick and nodular? That is because there is pyloric sphincter. In the pyloric end, there is pyloric sphincter. You see, this is the pyloric sphincter. Due to this pyloric sphincter, the pyloric end is thick and nodular. So this thing, this pyloric sphincter is a very important question for the OSPI. You have to remember that. Now, pyloric sphincter is present in the pyloric end. And this sphincter do, is formed by thickening and blending of the circular smooth muscle. So keep it in mind that the pyloric end contains a pyloric sphincter and due to the presence of the pyloric sphincter, the pyloric end is thick and nodular and the formation of the pyloric sphincter is done by the thickening and blending of the circular smooth muscle. Now let's come to the borders. You see there are two borders that is the left border or the greater curvature and the right border or the lesser curvature. So this border we know this as the lesser curvature. And this border, the left border, is called the greater curvature. The lesser curvature is actually concave and the greater curvature is actually convex. Now, let's come to the surface. There are two surfaces. The anterior superior surface or anterior surface, that is the surface we can see and one is the posterior inferior surface that is in the behind posterior inferior surface and anterior superior surface now <coughs> okay now let's come to the parts of the stomach stomach can be divided into three parts they are the fundus the body and a pyloric part now what is the fundus a horizontal line passes from the cardiac notch to the lesser curvature. Okay. A horizontal line travels from the cardiac notch to the lesser curvature and forms a line. The upper part of the line is called fundus. The upper part of the line is called fundus. Fundus contains fundic gas. Now cardiac notch. The upper part of the greater, the upper part of the lesser curvature is called cardiac notch. It is where the esophagus ends. So this is the fundus, this is the cardiac notch. Now, the body. You see in between the fundus and the pyloric part, we can see the body. Now, the pyloric part. Below the part of the line formed by the joining of the angular notch and the greater curvature. You see, a joining from the angular notch up to the greater curvature. Below this part is called pylorus. Below this part is called pylorus. So you see, a joining from the angular notch up to the greater curvature. Below this part, below this line is the pyloric part. Now, the pyloric part can be again divided into three parts, sorry, two parts. The pyloric part can be divided into two parts. That is one, the pyloric antrum, that is the pyloric antrum. Pyloric antrum is 7.5 cm in length. Another one is the pyloric canal. It is 2.5 cm in length. Total pyloric part is actually 10 cm in length. 7.5 plus 2.5. Now, 
what is the attachment of the greater curvature and the attachment of the lesser curvature the attachment of the greater curvature are greater omentum gast gastrospenic ligament and gastrophrenic ligament i am saying again the attachment of the greater curvature are gastric and sorry greater omentum gastrospenic ligament and gastrophrenic ligament and the attachment of the lesser curvature is lesser omentum it is lesser omentum now let's come to the artery supply of the stomach so before we start the artery supply um we we would like to i would like to tell you some basic things we are going to watch a video where you can see the three dimensional pictures of all the arteries supplying the stomach right so let's um see the video The blood supply of the stomach is a topic that can cause a lot of belly ache for anatomy students at exam time. So let's take a look at it in 3D. Let's start by reviewing the parts of the stomach. The main parts of the stomach include the fundus, cardia, greater curvature, lesser curvature, and pylorus. The different curvatures of the stomach have blood supply from different arteries. The greater curvature of the stomach is supplied by two arteries. The right gastro-omental artery supplies the inferior part of the greater curvature. Okay, so they are saying the right gastro-omental artery, it supplies the inferior part of the greater curvature. I have already told you that this is the greater curvature and this is the lesser curvature. So another name of the right gastro-omental artery is right gastro artery. So we can see that the right gastro artery actually supplies the inferior part of the greater curvature. The left gastro-omental artery supplies the superior part of the greater curvature. Okay, so the left gastro artery, also known as the left gastro-omental artery, it supplies the superior part of the greater curvature. The greater curvature. The most superior portion of the greater curvature and the fundus of the stomach are supplied by the short gastric arteries okay so the most superior part as they said of the greater curvature this is actually the fundus of the stomach you see the fundus of the stomach is supplied by the short gastric artery it is supplied by the short gastric artery which are small branches of the splenic artery the lesser curvature is supplied by two different arteries the inferior part is supplied by the right gastric artery, which comes from the hepatic artery, a branch of the common hepatic artery. The superior part and the cardia are supplied by the left gastric artery, which is a direct branch from the celiac trunk. Okay, so the lesser curvature actually, it is supplied by two arteries. Okay, that is the left gastric artery and the right gastric artery. All of these stomach arteries arise from the celiac trunk, which is the first of the three major trunks of the abdominal aorta. Okay, so now we know the name of the arteries. A most important thing that is asked in the viva that what are the, from which branch does this artery arise from? What are the branch from where this artery come? So now I'm going to tell you the branches from where these artery arise. The left gastric artery is actually a branch of the celiac trunk. You see this celiac trunk? If this is the celiac trunk, okay. So from celiac trunk comes the left gastric artery. And the right gastric artery is a branch of the common hepatic artery. The short gastric artery is the branch of the splenic artery. The left gastroepiploic artery is the branch of the splenic artery. The right gastroepiploic artery is the branch of the gastroduodenal artery. So we can see 
that the left gastroepiploic artery and the right gastroepiploic artery supplies the greater omentum. The short gastric artery supplies the fundus. The left gastric artery and the right gastric artery supplies the lesser omentum. Applied by the right gastric artery. Now let's see this. If this is a picture and you have to draw this picture in your examination copy, you can see these are the short gastric arteries. They are supplying the fundus of the stomach. The left gastroepiploic artery and the right gastroepiploic artery, they are supplying the uh, greater curvature. The left gastric artery and the right gastric artery, they are supplying the lesser curvature. Here, the left gastric artery is the direct branch of the celiac trunk. Okay, and the right gastric artery is a branch of the common hepatic artery. It is the branch of the common hepatic artery. And the splenic arteries, the short gastric artery, you see the short gastric artery, they are the branch of the splenic artery from here. And you see the left gastroepiploic artery and the right gastroepiploic artery, these two artery, they are branches of different arteries. The left gastroepiploic artery, there it is also a branch of the splenic artery. And the right gastroepiploic artery is a branch of the duodenal artery. The gastroduodenal artery, you see, it's coming from behind and is supplying the lower part of the greater momentum. So I hope you understand the artery supply of the stomach. Now the nerve supply of the stomach, it is sub, the stomach is supplied mainly by autonomic nerve. As you know, the autonomic nerve consists of sympathetic nerve and parasympathetic nerve. The sympathetic nerve supply is given by thoracic 6 to thoracic 9 segment of the spinal cord. And the parasympathetic nerve is given by the vagus nerve. The parasympathetic supply is given by the vagus nerve. Sympathetic nerve causes constriction of the pyloric sphincter and it also causes the relaxation of smooth muscle. And this is the opposite for the parasympathetic nerve. The parasympathetic nerve causes relaxation of the pyloric sphincter and contraction of the smooth muscle. Okay. Now let's come to the cells of the stomach. In the stomach, we have some several cells and each cell has different <coughs> secretory functions. <coughs> Sorry. First of all, let's come to the chief cell. The chief cells, another name is zygogenic cell. Zymo, sorry, zymogenic cell. The zymogenic cell actually secretes pepsin. That is pepsinogen and lipase. Then, the parietal cell or the Oxyntic cells, they actually secrete HCl, hydrochloric acid, and also intrinsic factors. Then the mucosa, you know, there are surface mucus cells and mucosal neck cells. The mucosa actually secretes the mucosa, that is the mucin in the alkaline fluid and mucin in the acidic fluid, that is mucosa. And also G cells or enteroendocrine cells, also this is known as the argentafin cells. Argentafin cells is one kind of enteroendocrine cells and Argentafin cells actually um, secretes serotonin and gastrin. Argentafin cells secret serotonin. Now let's come to the layers of the stomach. Before that I would like to tell you about the glands of the stomach. Actually in the stomach there are um, several glands you know one call is one is called the cardiac gland another call is the pyloric gland now okay one thing i forgot to mention you know you saw the parietal cells are releasing the intrinsic factors intrinsic factor we call it the intrinsic factor of castle the intrinsic factor of castle helps in the absorption of vitamin b12 Please note this, the intrinsic factor of castle helps in the absorption of vitamin B12. Now, 
let's come back to the layers. So if we see the layers of the stomach, we can see it has four layers. This is the serosa, the serosa layer, and then the muscular is external layer or muscular layer, then submucosal layer, and ultimately the mucosal layer. The muscular layer or the muscular is external layer can further be divided into three parts. That is, outer longitudinal layer. Suppose this is from outwards to inwards. So you see this is the outer longitudinal layer. This is the middle circular layer. And this is the inner oblique layer. Let me repeat again. The muscular layer or the muscular is external has consists of three layers outer longitudinal layer middle circular layer and inner oblique layer then comes the submucosa and after that comes the mucosa the mucosa can be further divided into three layers that is muscularis mucosa muscularis mucosa sorry um the spelling is i think wrong over here please correct it the lamina propria and the lining epithelium which is also the surface epithelium so the parts of the mucosas are muscularis mucosa, you see this part, the lamina propria and the surface epithelium. Now, the lamina propria actually, this part contains the gastric gland, you see over here, the lamina propria contains the gastric gland. And you know, the lining epithelium of the surface epithelium is simple columnar epithelium, just keep it in mind. The lining epithelium is simple columnar epithelium. Okay, so one thing you have to remember that is an information that food stays in the stomach for about four to six hours. Just keep it in mind. Now let's go to the interior of the stomach. So if we do the cut section of the stomach, then we what we will see in the inside of the stomach, we can see many things. The interior of the stomach this part is called you see the gastric rugi you see rugi of mucosa it is also called the gastric yugi now how is the gastric rugi formed the gastric rugi is formed by fold of mucous membrane the gastric rugi is formed by the folding of the mucous membrane this is actually a temporary thing it is obliterated during the distension of the stomach by food. Okay, so the rugi is actually, it is a temporary fold and it obliterates when the stomach is full of food. Apart from the rugi, there are other things like gastric pit. You know, uh, I don't know if you can see over here, if you want to see this picture, you see these layers, these folds of the mucous membrane, they are called the gastric rugi and you see the dots over here the pores they are called the gastric pits and in front there is gastric canal now what is gastric canal it is actually a passage which is formed by the mucosal fold the gastric canal lies along the lesser curvature the gastric canal lies along the lesser curvature of the stomach and it extends from the cardiac orifice to the pyloric orifice. So again, I'm saying that gastric canal is a passage which is formed by the mucosal fold extending from the cardiac orifice to the pyloric orifice. Liquids, just remember that liquid substance passes through the gastric canal. Liquid substance passes through the gastric canal. So we can see the rugi of mucosa or the gastric rugi it is a fold of the mucous membrane which is not permanent because when the stomach is filled with food, it gets distended, it obliterates. That means the rugi cannot be shown. The pits are the small pores within the rugi of the mucosa or gastric mucosa and, sorry, gastric rugi and the gastric canal, it is a passage which is formed by the mucosa fold which carries, actually, uh, it carries liquid substance and it extends from the cardiac orifice to the pyloric orifice. Now, if you see over here, this is a 3D model of the stomach. 
cut section and if we uh, if you see the inner part you can see all these things you see the elevated part these are the folds of mucous membrane these are the rugi you see the rugi over here these are the rugi and you see I, I think you can see over here but there are small pits in between the rugi these small pits are called gastric pit and you see this part this part is called the gastric canal which extends from the cardiac orifice up to the pyloric orifice now let's come to the relation of the anterior superior surface and the posterior inferior surface of the stomach the relation of the anterior superior surface The relation of the anterior superior surface, as I've told you in the beginning, that the part you see from the uh, in front, it is called the anterior and superior surface. The anterior superior surface actually gives relation to the liver, the diaphragm, and the anterior abdominal wall. Now, what is very important over here is the posterior superior surface. The relation of the posterior, sorry, the, the relation of the posterior inferior surface. So the relation of the posterior inferior surface, another name of the posterior inferior surface is stomach bed. Uh, the or will not be over here, it will be the relation of the posterior inferior surface. Another name of the posterior inferior surface is called stomach bed. This is a very, very important question. Then what are the contents of the stomach bed? Okay, what are the contents of the stomach bed? So these are actually the contents of the stomach bed. So we can see that there is the diaphragm, the anterior surface of the left kidney, the left supranal gland, pancreas, the left transverse colon, the left colic flexure, and the left splenic artery. I've written down these points because they're very important. They come as a question that what are the contents of the stomach bed? So if this question comes, then you have to draw this picture and uh, write down these points. So what is, the, what is the question associated with the stomach bed? The question comes like this, that draw and label the stomach bed or short note stomach bed. Now let us go to peptic ulcer disease. <coughs> what is peptic ulcer disease? Pepti peptic ulcer disease is actually, we know it as ulcer, you know, the irritation in the stomach wall it, we know it as the ulcer it's called the PUD the peptic ulcer disease the what are the types of the peptic ulcer disease they are mainly of two types one is the gastric ulcer another one is the duodenal ulcer you see this is actually um, endoscopic um, picture of peptic ulcer you see this is the ulcer so the common so what are the common sites of the peptic ulcer disease the common site is the lesser curvature of the stomach number one the lesser curvature of the stomach the first part of the duodenum the first part of the duodenum and the lower part of the esophagus so you see it's one in line the lower part of the esophagus the lesser curvature of the stomach and the first part of the duodenum in between this the lesser curvature of the stomach is the most common site for ulcer Okay, so another thing we can know that what is actually the common site of gastric carcinoma. Okay, remember that the lesser curvature is the common site for ulcer and the greater curvature is actually a common site for gastric carcinoma. Please remember it. Now, what is the agent that is responsible for PUD or peptic ulcer disease, the name of the agent is H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori, just remember it. Now, anatomical position of the stomach, as we don't have a viscera right now, so when you um, hold the viscera in front of the examiner or in front of the teacher, uh, you have to hold the stomach in the anatomical position, just like you did in the thorax card. You hold, you held the um, lung. You also you have the heart, the diaphragm in anatomical position, and that is same for the stomach. 
So these are the anatomical points or the main anatomical position of stomach. The cardiac orifice lies upwards which is situated 2.5 cm left to the median plane at the level of the 11th thoracic vertebra. That means the upper orifice or the cardiac orifice if you see there is a midline in the middle so from the midline the cardiac orifice lies in the left 2.5 cm. Okay, and behind the cardiac orifice is the level of the 11th thoracic vertebra. Now the pyloric orifice, it is directed downwards, which is thick and nodular. You, all, you already know why it is thick and nodular. That is due to the presence of the pyloric sphincter. The pyloric orifice is directed downwards, which is thick and nodular and which lies at the level of the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra. So, in behind of the pyloric orifice is the lower border of the first lumbar vertebra. You already know that the greater curvature is convex. Okay, and it forms the left border of the stomach. The lesser curvature is concave, which forms the right border of the stomach. Right. And you know that the lesser curvature is now, you know now that it is more prone to ulcer. And the greater curvature, it is more prone to gastric carcinoma. The anterior superior surface is directed upwards and forwards. The posterior inferior surface, or we can also say that is the stomach bed that is directed downwards and backwards. Now we will know something about the uh, greater omentum. Before uh, going to the greater omentum, we have to understand that what is omentum. Omentum is actually a fold of peritoneum. So to understand omentum, we have to understand peritoneum first. So let's come to peritoneum. What is peritoneum? Peritoneum is a fibrocerous sac which covers the abdominal viscera. You see, this is a fibrocerous sac which covers the viscera. Okay. The peritoneum has two layers. One layer is the outer layer that is the parietal peritoneum. Another one is the inner layer, the yellow mud, which is the visceral peritoneum. The visceral peritoneum cannot be separated from the viscera. That means the visceral peritoneum is attached to this viscera. So it cannot be separated from the viscera. And the outer layer is called the parietal peritoneum. Now, what is actually the function of the peritoneum? The function of the peritoneum is to protect the viscera. Its or function is also to help in the movement of the viscera, and it helps in dialysis. So it protects the viscera, it helps in the movement of viscera, and it keeps part in dialysis. Now, what are the difference of peritoneum in gender? That is, in male, the peritoneum is of one type. In female, the peritoneum is of other. In the male, the peritoneum is a closed sac. And in the female, the peritoneum is actually open. The peritoneum is an open sac through uterine tube or fallopian tube. So in the female, the peritoneum cannot completely close. It is open through the fallopian tube or the uterine tube and in male the peritoneum is a closed sac that peritoneum is a fibrocerous sac that covers the abdominal viscera. Now the fold of this peritoneum is called omentum. Again the fold of this peritoneum is called omentum. Now let the omentum can be further divided into two parts that is the gastric omentum and another one is Sorry, the one is called the greater momentum, another one is called the lesser momentum. Okay, now you see the stomach along the greater curvature is the greater momentum, and along the lesser curvature is the lesser momentum. Now, momentum, the greater momentum, has total four layers. The greater momentum has four layers. The first layer is continuous with the fourth layer, and the second layer is continuous with the third layer. Okay, the first layer is continuous with the fourth, and the second layer is continuous with the 
Third, now where is the extension of the greater momentum? The greater momentum extends from the greater curvature of the stomach up to the porta hepatic of liver. The greater momentum extends from the lesser curvature of the stomach up to the porta hepatic of the liver. Now what are the contents of the greater momentum? It is the right and left gastroepiploic vessels. The content of the greater momentum is the right and left gastroepiploic vessels. What is the function of the greater momentum? The greater momentum acts as a storehouse of fat. You see all these um, yellow things, these are fat. So the greater momentum is the storehouse of fat. It acts as a policeman of abdomen. Okay. It acts as a policeman of abdomen. Now, this is a very important question. That why does greater momentum is called the policeman of abdomen? It is a clinical anatomy question. The answer is that the greater momentum actually presents spread of infection. Okay. So, what does the greater momentum do? It prevents the spread of infection. Okay. And it seals off the surrounding area. Do you understand what I am saying? Why is the greater momentum called the policeman of abdomen? Because it prevents the spread of the infection and it seals off the surrounded infected area. This is why greater momentum is called the policeman of abdomen. Now, Let's come to the lesser momentum here in this point. The lesser momentum actually extends from the lesser curvature of the stomach up to 2.5 cm m to the duodenum. So the lesser momentum extends from the stomach up to the 2.5 cm of duodenum. The lesser momentum has two layers. Okay, it has two layers. What are the content of the lesser momentum? It is the right and left gastric artery. Here the great content of the greater momentum was right and left, left gastroepiploic artery. In the lesser momentum, the content is right and left gastric artery. And what is the content of the <coughs> right margin, right free margin of the lesser momentum? The contents of the right free margin of the lesser momentum are portal vein hepatic artery and common hepatic duct. I am saying again, the content of the lesser momentum is the right and left gastric vessels, but the content of the right free margin of the lesser momentum is portal vein, hepatic artery and common hepatic duct. Okay. Now, we will know in short what is epiploic foramen. You see, this is the epiploic foramen. Epiploic foramen is a vertical slit-like opening where lesser sac communicates with the greater sac. Epiploic foramen is a vertical slit-like opening where lesser sac communicates with the greater sac. Okay. So what is sac actually? As we have already told you that the peritoneal cavity is like a sac. It is a fibrocerous sac, right? So, the peritoneal cavity is a sac. It is divided actually into two sacs, the total peritoneal cavity. In front of the stomach, it is the greater sac. In back of the stomach, it is the lesser sac. So, where in the vertical slit like opening, the lesser sac and the greater sac communicates together is called the epiploic foramen. What is the boundary of this? What is the boundary of the epiploic foramen? Anteriorly, it is bound by portal vein, hepatic artery and common hepatic duct. The epiploic foramen is bounded anteriorly by portal vein, hepatic artery and common hepatic duct. It is bounded posteriorly by the inferior vena cava, 12 thoracic vertebra. It is bounded superiorly by the caudate process of the liver. The caudate, C-A-U-D-A-T-E, the caudate process of the liver. Inferiorly, it is bound 
by the third part of the duodenum and horizontal part of hepatic artery. So this was our item for the stomach that is item number three. I hope you all understood and enjoyed the class. Um, goodbye and best of luck.